Well, good morning. Welcome to Living Hope Bible Church. Glad to have you with us this morning. I hope you're glad to be here. Was that a beautiful day yesterday or what? And today is supposed to be a little warmer. And then the next couple days after that are going to be in the 60s. And then it's going to be back to reality after that. It looks like after that back down to the 40s. So, But it's a beautiful day today. And it's a beautiful day in here to worship the Lord. So would you stand and lift your voices? Uh, even if you can't carry a tune, because Rich can, so follow him. So, <laughs> anyway, take it away, Rich.
mercy, but most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus, Lord, that you sent here to be the perfect sacrifice to die for our sins, and Lord, we just thank you for that gift that you've given us. Hopefully, everyone here has accepted that gift and to follow you as their Lord and Savior, Lord, to follow Jesus, and because of that, spend eternity in heaven with you. But Lord, this morning, as we're gathered together, we just ask a blessing on each and every one here. Help them to focus on you this morning, Lord, and be able to face the week because they've been in your presence this morning, Lord. Let's bless every facet of this service to your holy name this morning, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to draw your attention to the prayer concerns that are listed in the bulletin. Um, Doug Paul's uh, uncle we were praying for him last week, uh, but he passed away. They had the funeral for uh, Wilford Becker, and so we need to pray for that family. Um, any other? We need to pray for Yolanda Garrett. She is still um, not doing too well in Iowa City, and so we need to pray for Yolanda. I got to see Gilbert Hauk this week, which was a treat. Um, and he's doing um, he's doing okay, um, but he could still use your prayers, Sharon. Uh, Sister Mara Loretta Hall is having a lot of problems. Did you say Loretta Hall? Okay, is having some health issues. Any other prayer concerns, Jack? So, Jack, first of all, it's good to have you back. Um, good to see you. And Kathy. We got a surprise when we were eating. We got to see Kathy in the restaurant the other night. So that that was good at, at barbecues. So that wasn't an advertisement <laughs> unless you wanted one. Um, Jeff. Uh, we're praying for you and your shoulder. If you need someone to drive your motorcycle, let me know. Um, keep it warm for you. Um, so pray for Jeff. He fell and shoulder. Yeah. Any other 
prayer concerns. Victor? Uh, the people affected have been fire in Eddyville. Okay, there was a fire in Eddyville, so pray for those affected. All right, if there's no more prayers, let, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we have all of these names on our list, and we just humbly submit them to you today. Uh, Lord, we may not know them personally or of their specific situation, but Lord, we just ask that you hear our cries on their behalf. Lord, I just pray that you move through their body, give them exactly what they need, and if it's healing, bring healing to them. And Lord, we remember those that have lost loved ones and our heart goes out to them and we ache with them. And so, Lord, I just pray that you bring them comfort and a peace that transcends all understanding. Lord, we pray for those that are serving overseas, those that have been deployed. We just ask that you keep them safe. At a time of unrest and turmoil, we just pray that you you provide that, that certainty and that safety that they need. And Lord, be with them and let them feel your presence in the midst of difficult times. And so, Lord, we just give you all of these prayer concerns. And we ask that you come and join us in this service and open our hearts and minds to what you have to say through it all. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At this time, if you have tithes and offerings, you can take them to the box in the back. But don't get overrun with children because they are heading to the back. Uh, preschool through sixth grade, you will be going with Michelle. And we will say a quick blessing for them. Join with me as we bless the children. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just pray for all the children here. We thank you for bringing them to us, and we just pray for their safety. And Lord, I just pray that they may feel, um, Lord, just that, that they're loved by you. And so, uh, Lord, let them receive that gift today. And Lord, we pray for Michelle that she may teach all your truth. And um, Lord, just be a great example to them. And Lord, thank you for calling her to this. And so, Lord, we just pray for all these things. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. As they are departing, I want to invite you to turn with me to Ephesians 1 through 16, excuse me, Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. This is what was written, Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, employ you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, and so he might fill all things. 
And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, and some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. That's God's word for us today. Okay, would you bow your heads as we ask a blessing on Pastor Mark this morning. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just lift up Pastor Mark before you this morning. Lord, just bless him. Uh, fill him to overflowing with your Holy Spirit as he brings his special message this morning, Lord, as he honors Pastor Dave, who now resides with you, Lord. So we thank you so much for Pastor Dave. We thank you so much for Mark, and we just ask a blessing upon him right now as he brings your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're taking a break. We've been working our way through uh, the 100 most important stories of the Bible and we're on about number 70 or 71. I can't even remember anymore. And uh, so we're, we're cruising through and we're in the book of Acts. But I really wanted to take a Sunday and honor Pastor Dave. And so some of the flowers up here are from his funeral. And I just thought it was appropriate to honor him on a Sunday morning where he felt most home right where I'm standing. And uh, so that's my goal today is to honor God, but then also honor David. As a church, we can honor the man that made such an impact on each one of our lives. I want to start with our church history. This is kind of interesting. So in 1880, our church was formed. Now, in the first service, I asked Jerry Potts if he remembered the first uh, foundation. And just for the record, he didn't appreciate that remark. Um, so let's see, who could I ask here? No, I better not. Uh, offending one person, each service is important, I think. Um, and so uh, in 1930, we had the church built. And to build the church, the, the original church back there, we had borrowed from the denomination $720 to build it. Wouldn't you like to be able to do that? And so we built it. It caught fire in 1930. So it was built in 1880, caught on fire in 1930. We reborrowed that money and uh, built the, the church that is standing there. And in 1934, it was renamed the Railroad Congregational Church. Now, the Congregational Church, the Congregationalists, were the ones who come over um, fleeing persecution. So they were some of the first denominations in, in America. But we were known as the Railroad Congregational Church. And people in town will tell you that we were... Um, they called them the um, uh, Railroad Widows. Wasn't that what they called it? Anybody correct me? I think it was something like that, where the railroaders would be working and it would be the women that were here. Um, and the Congregational Church ended up forming and morphing into what's known as the UCC Church. Um, and so we became part of the UCC Church. Now, in the 1970s, I still have a letter from New York from the head of the UCC church. Um, and they were writing this church to say, it appears as though you just have a really small contingency in numbers, like three or four people. Uh, would you like to shut the building down? Is the building in, in good standing? And someone responded back saying, no, 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 no. There's three or four of us still here taking care of the property. Everything is okay. 
And so they did not shut the church down. But then um, in 1981, October of 81, they asked Dave Albert to start preaching. And Dave ran or owned Thomas Implement here in town. And so he was doing both at that time. And then eventually he became just a pastor and, and he sold the implement uh, dealership. Uh, in 1986, we adopted a new name, Elton Congregational Church. And the UCC church was heading in a direction that we disagreed with as a congregation. And a lot of denominations own the building you're in. And so it was with the UCC church. They technically owned our building. So if we would have said, we want to become an independent church, we want to separate from the UCC, they would have said, fine, you have our blessing, you just can't use our church. Right? That's what they could have said. But through much prayer, that they end up gifting us our church. They did request that we pay off the original loan of $720 from the 30s. We hadn't paid a dollar on it. I don't know. And so anyway, we paid that off and then we became an independent church. Our preschool opened in 1993 and has been operating ever since. And I make this point, one of Dave's last times here, we were trying to decide for the uh, congregational meeting uh, one of his last congregational meetings, we were trying to decide, like, uh, what, what do we, what direction do we take? This was a number of years ago, and Dave said, we will always have a preschool. And so, anyway, that was, um, that showed his heart and his passion for the preschool. In 1998, our legal name was changed to Living Hope Bible Church, when he kind of picked the name out, and I love the name. I, I said that at first service. I love the name Living Hope. And uh, when I was in Kentucky and uh, before I got the call from Dave, the word hope just kept coming into my mind. And, and you know, I, I always say choose a word that will dominate your year. And for whatever reason, hope was just something that resonated with me and, and I was running a basketball ministry down there, and I always said that, that the boys would come for basketball and leave with hope. And, um, and so uh, hope was uh, just on my heart. And then when he tells me the name of the church and I find out it's Living Hope, it was just like a flag, like, okay, this is interesting. And then I said at the first service, another thing that was interesting was I'd had visions of a church having an old bus, an old bus. And I thought, what a cool thing it would be cool to, to have. And then as I got to know Dave and he was showing me some old pictures, this church used to have that bus that I saw in, in my vision. So that was just kind of interesting as well. And so I was hired in 2009 and it was bizarre how God God had been working, um, you know, my first job right out of college was up in, in Wisconsin where I met Tony Garrett, and I knew he was from the Elden area, and then we separated way sometime, and, uh, and then I get a call from him out of the blue. I hadn't seen him for 10, 15 years, and he said that uh, he had been working for my brother, and uh, just this, all this, how this all came together and said, I hear you want to be a pastor. And I said, I do. I'm going to school for that. And he said, well, I'm at a church now. And when Tony and I knew each other, neither one of us were Christians. And, uh, and he said, would you like to interview? And so uh, that's when I first heard about Living Hope, only to discover that my, my mom had been part of a Bible study in this church. My mother-in-law and my mom listened to Pastor Dave every single Sunday. Um, and so just fascinating how it all came about. And I want to say this. Uh, so many pastors enter the profession. And they're really thrown to the 
wolves. That, that's not a, an, a completely accurate description because the church is not full of wolves. Um, but their pastors are really, they learn on the fly. And so I, I had three years under Pastor Dave. And we didn't always see eye to eye, but we had mutual love and respect for each other. And I learned so very, very much from him. And so that's something that um, maybe someday I'll get a pass on. And, um, and so today I wanted to, to preach on some biblical lessons that I learned through, with my time with him. And when you look back over the statistics of the church, this church was the strongest when Dave and I were ministering together. Just kind of interesting when you look at numbers and the amount of things we had going on. And so that that was a testament to, to his ministry and leadership. Key question today, what biblical lessons did I learn from Pastor Dave? Our key idea, this really doesn't answer the question, but instead gives a teaser, right? After 31 years of ministry uh, in this church, we were all blessed by Pastor Dave's preaching and teaching. This has come to me. How many of you uh, were baptized by Dave? Whoa, yeah, that's good. How many of you had... Uh, did he have your wedding? This is probably going to be fewer. Yeah? Okay. So I'm up top. Ah, Sarah, he had yours. Um, what about, has he uh, had a funeral? Did he have a funeral for someone you loved? Yeah. He, he had so many funerals. Um, there were years where he had one, on average, almost one a week, which is just a, a, a large amount. Um, how many of you did he lead to the Lord? Yeah. Um, he had such a profound impact on, on all of us, didn't he? Key scripture is this, Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There's a lot packed in that particular verse, but I want to draw you to living a life worthy of your calling, the worthy of your calling. Um, and so that's where I want to start today. The first lesson is you have hope in your calling. Live a life worthy of your calling. And, you know, I'm going to, in these, I have the word hope there for a reason. And so often when we think of the word hope, we, we may correlate it more to wish, but in reality, as a Christian, that word hope has a ton of potential energy. You, you know, like, like you're, you're trying to keep it in a box, but it keeps wanting to bounce out. The word hope, there's so much potential energy in it. That is that we're, we're, when we use the word hope, we, we expect that something great is going to happen when we use it in our terms. And so in 4.1... Um, he says, again, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you have been called. And then he tells us how we're to walk in our calling. Many of us have had a calling that we know we're in the place that God designed us. But we're to do it with humility, with gentleness, with patience with tolerance for one another, and in love. That word love is going to ring true a lot today. And so Dave's calling cost him, and it cost his family. He loved his implement dealership. He loved it, and he loved working on tractors. And if you knew Dave, 
He was so mechanical. Like he was brilliant. Smart, smart guy. And, um, and he loved what he did. And when, when he decided to take on the church, when he, I don't know if he ever knew where it would lead. I don't know if he ever knew that it would fully take him out of the, the dealership, right? Or, and instead, um, it took him out and it came with a cost, financial and time as well. Um, and so when he answered God's call, uh, it was a huge sacrifice to Dave. And he loved this church. He put it first, sometimes at the cost of family activities and at the cost of things that he would have rather been doing. But instead he put the church first and he was always a hard, hard worker as well. He took his calling as a pastor very, very seriously and something that he wanted to live up to and do the very, very best he could at. So the second thing is, put your hope in love. Some of you are like, love, ugh. right? Like, it's a little washed out and we overdefine love and and it doesn't mean as much to us, but we know that we can put our hope in love. And in Matthew 22, 37 through 39, uh, here Jesus was asked and he was trying, they were trying to pin uh, him down and trying to, to stump him, right? And so one of the teachers of the law said, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So the Jewish people had 600 some laws. And so this uh, teacher of the law was trying to pin it on and trying to uh, get him to answer something wrong. And he boiled them all down to two. First, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But then he said, this is the great and the foremost commandment. But then the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Whoa. Like the Sunday school answer is to love God. We know that's what we're to do. And then he says, oh, by the way, if you love God, then you're going to love other people too. Well, that's a lot more difficult. It's easy to love God, but sometimes it's hard to love other people. We, we had an ordinary neighbor in Minnesota, and he used to say, people sure love me, but I don't love them. <laughs> you had to know him. It was pretty funny. So the, he, Jesus is saying that you love God, and if you love God, then you're going to love other people. And Dave had a saying, he would always say, people, not programs, people, not ministries, right? It's all about the people the, you don't do something for the sake of ministry. You do it for the sake of the people. The people are going to benefit from it. And he would often say, you know, they need the church more than the church needs them. So we're going to keep loving them interesting point and so we put our hope in love and we know in first corinthians 13 uh, this is a passage paul wrote and it's often used in weddings and i use it in weddings and it's all about love but in reality paul wrote it in how we're to love one another and so he wrote, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have a gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. 
Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous, love does not brag, it is not arrogant, does not act unbecoming, it does not seek its own, it is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And ultimately it says, but now faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Dave understood love. And he loved you all. And he loved this church. And when I say church, he loved the building. But he loved you more. So put your hope in love. Sometimes love lets us down, doesn't it? And there's times where you're like, I'm not sure I can love again. But in reality, we are to put our hope in love. Because in the end, love never fails. The third lesson. Express your hope through worship. Let me tell you this. Practice Excellence. Excellence is a buzzword. When I worked in manufacturing, it was a buzzword. You always wanted to practice excellence. But when you asked people, they didn't know what that meant. The word excellence. We don't have to look too far with Pastor Dave to see how he practiced excellence. Aristotle says, excellence is never an accident. It is the result of high intention, sincere effort, and intelligence, or intelligent execution. Uh, it represents choices of many alternatives. So with all the choices and alternatives out there, you're making the wise decisions in order to practice excellence. In Colossians 3.17, this is what it says. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So listen to this. Whatever you do, if you're doing it for God's glory and the very best you can do it, you're worshiping. You're worshiping God. And so uh, in New Testament times, the word work and worship went hand in hand. You, were, you weren't just worshiping on a Sunday morning for an hour. Instead, you're worshiping while you're working if you're willing to give God the credit and you're doing the very best you can. So Dave... I think about his excellence. He took pride in knowing the English language. He loved the etymology, understanding where all the words come from. I remember hearing a number of different sermons where he would trace the, the meaning of some of the words. And so it was fascinating to me. And he, and he always wrote with great precision. And he was proud of it. And we would get into debates on how you were supposed to pronounce words. And it was always entertaining. But part of that was he wanted excellence in everything. I think about the, the woodwork in, in this church. He loved oak, didn't he? And the, the excellence he had. And, and I worked with him long enough and he helped me make the, uh, a lot of the woodwork in my house. And I would see the boxes he would make and he would teach me a new technique or whatever. And, and then I would go to a furniture store and it was hard to look at cheap furniture the same way. You just couldn't, you'd say, oh, that doesn't meet his standard because he liked excellence. And so excellence is a matter of worship. Then... Fourth, there is hope for a better life. Each Sunday, I have the privilege of preaching the good news. 
the good news of Jesus Christ. And ultimately, Dave would teach over and over and over again. And adherence to biblical principles leads to a better life. If you ever get to a point in your life to say, how did I get here? I'm in a place I don't want to be. If you take a close look, it's a breakdown to biblical principles. When you follow what the Bible teaches, you will not ever be disappointed. I don't know anyone on their deathbed that said, gosh, I wish I would have lied more. I wish I would have stolen more from my friends. Right? No one thinks that. You see, adherence to biblical principles is a beautiful thing, and it leads to a better life. So 1 John 5, 2 through 3 says, By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and observe his commandments. By, by loving God and observing his commandments. I think about with our own children. One way we know they love us is if they do what we say. It's through their actions. And so it is with us. We're not going to go wrong through an adherence. To biblical principles. Fifth. And you'll know this. Very well. Place your hope. In Christ alone. We have so many other places. That we can try. To place our hope. But we're looking in all the wrong places. Hope is found in. One place. And that's through the death and resurrection. Of Jesus Christ. Dave made this a Christocentric church. And you would say, isn't all churches Christ-centered? No. Unfortunately, they're not. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, if you are one to write in your Bible like I am, I have this one highlighted in red with a star next to it. That means it's really important. For by grace you have been saved through faith. By grace, through faith, you're saved. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. It's Christ that provides the ultimate, the living hope that each one of us desire so very much. So how now shall I live? I'm rewording all the lessons that I learned from Pastor Dave. First, live a life worthy of your calling. You may say, what calling? God hasn't told me to be a pastor yet. When Dave and I talked about our calling, it's always interesting to me how other people decide to be a pastor. And Dave said, when I came to Christ, I felt the calling to be a pastor immediately. And I said, that's interesting. That happened to me too. I immediately felt the call to be a pastor. It made no sense. But that's how we felt. But you see, God wired you. He, he made you. He formed you. To be exactly who you are. And some of you have received a calling to be a teacher. Some a farmer. Some to work in a factory. Some to be a nurse. Some to be engineers. Some to be a stay-at-home mom. Or a stay-at-home dad. 
God has placed you on this earth for a specific purpose. I'm going to read a passage out of one of Dave's sermons. So if you remember, Pastor Dave had a stroke on January 1st of 2012. And uh, Winnie called me at 7 a.m. and said, Mark, you have to preach today. I said, uh, I haven't even taken my shower and that's an hour away. And so I cut my shower short. <laughs> and uh, the first thing that came to me was, well, I'll look at the sermon on his desk and I'll preach that. And I read the sermon on his desk and I said, there is no way I can preach that. It was so profound for the given circumstance. And so when he come back around, he was able to preach it. So remember, this was going to be preached on January 1st, right? And so I'm, I'm going to skip through it. But he said, before us are 365 days, roughly 8,600 hours. Remember I said excellence? <laughs> he was precise. A sobering reality is that it is highly unlikely that we will all be together 8,760 hours from now. Some of us will in all likelihood be with Jesus. Gone from this physical sphere of things. But if you were here, if you're here when those 8,760 hours are over, will you look back on them with joy or with regret? Which one will depend on whether we've committed every plan and all our ways to the Lord Jesus? And he says, folks, I don't need one of those um oh, oh okay sorry <laughs> he he was talking about a clock you may remember this illustration there's a website or at least back then that you could plug in all of your your medical history and it would create a countdown clock to your death He found it. <laughs> and he said, folks, I don't need one of those. I'm not a potential customer. God has numbered my days from before I was born. And so he says, are you investing your time in things that can be sent to heaven? It's reasonable to assume that there may be some level of diminishing productivity as we get older and our days are counted down. But the fact is, you nor I know uh, that we have one more day to live. And that leads us to, this, to the second point. And it's because time is limited, we need to use it wisely. The reason we must be careful in conducting ourselves according to scripture, obeying biblical principles, is because uh, the days are evil. Satan is a thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And the most effective war we can wage, um, the most effective war he can wage is against God's plan it, and it's to steal our time. And then you've been equipped by God to do some things that no one else could do. You don't have time to wait. You don't have time to harbor unforgiveness. It's interesting. That particular message would could have been summed up in all of these points. But in the end, he was kind of challenging us that during that sermon to live a life worthy of our calling. That God created a job for each one of us to do. And it's up to us to figure it out. 
and to do it. The second thing is we know we're to love God and love people. That particular passage wasn't just for pastors. It was for you too. To first love God and then strive to love people. Have an extra ounce of patience with them. Understanding, try to understand life through their eyes. And it's amazing how much love you can develop for the people around you and the people that you serve. The third thing is practice excellence. Worship while you work. Worship while you work. One time when I was working and, and this buzzword come out in a meeting on excellence, I, I kind of tried to decide what is the meaning of excellence? How could you put it into words? And I discovered this little poem or writing. Excellence is risk. Perfection is fear. Excellence is effort. Perfection is anger and frustration. Excellence is openness to being wrong, while perfection is having to be right. Excellence is spontaneity, while perfection is control. Excellence is flow. Perfectionism is pressure. Excellence is confidence. Perfectionism is doubt. Excellence is a journey. Perfectionism is a destination. Excellence is understanding while perfectionism is judgment. Excellence is encouraging while perfectionism is criticizing. Strive to practice excellence in everything you do. Fourth, follow biblical principles. We were talking about it in Sunday school. The first step of following biblical principles is knowing biblical principles, right? So if you're not digging into God's word, if you're not striving to understand what God wants from us, then you will always struggle with adhering to biblical principles because you may not know them. I'm amazed at the incredible wisdom that the Bible uh, teaches. It's just spot on. And I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying it's right. And ultimately, it will lead you to a better life. And the last thing, I implore you, put your hope in Christ. He's a living hope. He changed Dave's life forever. Bill was telling me about the ride in the 1972 Chevy pickup. Did I have that right? Where Dave came to Christ. And there were a lot of events that come together there with, with them. Um, but ultimately, it changed the course of his life forever. And it changed my life as well. And so Christ can be your guide. He can be your hope. I always relate uh, Christ to my anchor. We, we all have different ways of relating Christ, but he's the anchor I hold on to in the midst of a storm. And so if you've never put your faith and your hope and your trust in him, do it today. You know, Dave always carved out a piece of time at the end of every service, which happens to be right now. And he would extend an invitation. And the invitation is simply, if you need prayer for anything, to come forward. But especially if you've never said yes to Jesus and you want to do it publicly, 
If you say, I want to follow him, but I don't know exactly how, this is the time you can come and talk to me about it. And we can pray together. This isn't a time about me. This is a time about you. And he said, we must always offer this invitation. No matter if people come or not, that it always exists. So when you need a time of help, it's there. Let's stand and sing. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. And Lord, today we stand here humbled in your presence. Lord, I pray that we may live a calling that is worthy of the one set before us. And that we may do it with a motivation for you and to help others. And that love may be our motivation to. And so, Lord, just guide us and help us live our lives according to biblical principles. And in the end, let us give all of our hope to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a few announcements for you. You want to borrow my glasses? <laughs> Got it. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Tuesdays, a joint uh, trustee uh, deacon meeting at 7 p.m. And if you're a deacon or trustee and your box out there is the uh, agenda and plus an updated calling list. Uh, Mark passed out a calling list at the last deacon's meeting and... The numbers didn't like We should have left it that way because it would have been interesting whenever we called. We didn't it would have been who, fun. It would have been exciting because we wouldn't know who we were calling. So we could, it would have been a, a Russian roulette for all of us there. But anyway, it's a corrected list now so that the numbers will match up. So anyway, also on Wednesdays, all children's ministries, the CIM, CIA Jam and Blast uh, with a meal for all of them. So and... Uh, uh, remember the Sunday school classes that are written down there again. I actually had a class today, so you did. Yeah, I so. always knew you had class. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you're not a member uh, in one of those classes, uh, look one of them up there and, and join one. And I guess it says also get ready for clock confusion. Uh, is that coming forward? Uh, the March the 14th, we get to spring forward. We all enjoy that. So, yes, definitely. Uh, lose that hour. Uh huh. Well, it's good to see all of you here today um, and uh, have a great week. Enjoy the sunshine, but don't overdo it.
Trust me, I learned that the hard way a couple weeks ago. Um, and so let's sing our closing song.